Right into our architecture, technologies we use, but also our development process and the tools we have in charge for that. So about 10 years ago, a Hamburg-based startup began to build the Open Business Club, which later on was renamed to Xing. And they did it based on Perl and MySQL. And like the little camel looks a bit different from this perspective, our application looks a bit different today as well. But still, we heavily rely on Perl and MySQL. We are not using any of the modern web frameworks, no Catalyst or Dancer or anything. We even have our own homegrown templating system. But on the other hand, it's not all legacy code, so we also use Moose and some other technologies you may summarize under the label Modern Perl. So the application was growing, and um, at one point it became obvious that it's not such a good idea to let it grow beyond recognition. So step by step, we transformed into a more distributed architecture, where we have smaller independent components based on different technologies. Our technology stack has evolved over time. We still have lots of Perl, but also quite some Ruby on Rails. Our data science people love Scala. They are also running a Hadoop cluster. Our search is powered by Elasticsearch. And we have something called Insect for calculating first and especially second degree contacts. Frontend also has changed over time. Our HTML is more and more HTML5. And of course, JavaScript has become way more important over the years. About two years ago, we have finally replaced prototype with the jQuery. And more recently, we have added backbone to some parts of the platform, which is a framework to structure your JavaScript code. Our main data store is still MySQL, but we also use Redis as a key value store. We do a lot of caching with memcache, and we run a Swift or OpenStack cluster where we store files uploaded by our users, for example, images or PDFs. Youngest member of the family is React, a NoSQL store which powers a personalized news feed you see when you log into our platform. So the Perl application, internally we sometimes call it the core, it still plays a crucial role in our distributed architecture. But nowadays it is surrounded by about 20 Ruby on Rails applications plus a handful of uh, other more specialized components. And dependent on the part of the platform a user is using, their request might end up in a totally different application. The user, of course, does not notice it. And the reason is that all those components can communicate with each other. We have an internal REST API to exchange data in JSON. And we also have a public API. It's an application that basically collects data through the internal APIs and exposes it to the public through a more stable version REST API. That public API is consumed by third parties, but it's also consumed by some of our own mobile applications, for example. Now, REST is nice for synchronous communication, but we also have quite a number of use cases for asynchronous communication. And we use RabbitMQ for that. For example, if a user updates their CV data, we send an asynchronous message to inform the other applications 
that an update for this particular user has happened. So the other applications know they have to invalidate their caches in case they have a local copy of that data. Other use case might be some task that simply takes too long to have the user wait for it to finish. If the user uploads a picture and you have to generate quite a number of different thumbnails for that picture, you can't have the user wait for the process to finish. But you can also use asynchronous messaging to parallelize uh, some tasks. For example, think of a big migration where you have to modify some data for a large number of users. A naive approach would be to write a migration script that uh, takes one user after the other, loads it, modifies the data, writes it back to the database. And this can take quite some time if you have 14 million users. So what we do instead is write a very, very simple script that simply sends an MQP message for every user that has to be migrated. And then we have a number of worker machines listening to that kind of message. Whenever one of those has free capacity, it fetches the next message from the queue and processes it, which basically means migrates this particular user. And this is a very easy way to parallelize that migration. Coding-wise, it's very simple. And the AMQP infrastructure is something we have in place anyways. Now, we rely a lot on this asynchronous messaging. And so we were a bit scared that we might lose messages somewhere along the way. And this is where the Beetle came to life. Beetle adds high availability to AMQP messaging with redundant queues. That means it allows you to set up several message broker instances, and it replicates the message queue to those instances. In turn, it has to ensure that the message that you fetch from one queue and process is deleted from the replicated queues because you do not want to process it twice. Currently, it's available for Java, Ruby, and Perl. It's open source software. You can find it on github.com slash xing. So uh, you can simply have a look if you're interested in the details. So despite having this distributed architecture with uh, more and more smaller independent components, our Perl application has been growing. So, we made the decision to dissolve part of its functionality from this core Perl application in smaller components. And one major effort was to extract the profile front end, which is what we did last year. The profile is where the user can store their CV data. And we have dissolved the front-end functionality for that into a separate Rails application. This application basically has no database. It simply fetches the data it needs from the Perl application through the internal REST API. That's a bit painful every now and then. If you don't have a database, you don't have transactions. Also, you cannot use uh, lots of the Rails magic that's normally there to make a developer's life easier. But still, it works. When we were about to go live with this new application, which was a big release, we also changed the design of the profile and so on, we were a bit scared about performance of that application. So it was expected to receive about 30 million requests a day. And then again, Rails is not exactly that famous for its performance. So what could we do about it? 
basically we wanted to test uh, if our application could stand the traffic. And we did it again using our AMQP infrastructure. So whenever a user requested a profile, the request was routed to the old code in the Perl application, and it was served from there. But on top, on, on top of serving the request, the application sent an AMQP message about this profile being requested. And a worker receiving that message followed up with a shadow request to the new application. In the beginning, we dropped most of the messages and closely monitored our new application's performance. And when it was doing well, we slowly increased the percentage of requests made to the old application that triggered a shadow request to the new one. So in the end, we felt quite confident that our new application could really handle the traffic. As a side effect, it provided us with some kind of, well, testing the new application with live data. So instead of sitting down and thinking about all the edge cases that might occur, we had those shadow calls running for quite a while. And this very special user that has a weird combination of settings and some very special data in their profile, most likely that profile was requested at least once during that time. And that means a shadow request to this particular profile was made to our new application. And if the new application wasn't able to handle this particular edge case, we would find something in our log files or our monitoring system. So we could fix some of those broken edge cases even before going live. So we have dissolved some of the functionality from the Perl application, but it is still providing crucial parts of our platform. So it still does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Currently our Perl application has about 600,000 lines of code. About 300,000 uh, of them are really Perl code. The rest is HTML templates, JavaScript and so on. According to Clock, there's also some Visual Basic in here, but I'm not so sure about that. The Perl application receives about 30 million external user-facing requests a day. This is not the number of requests our platform is receiving, it's only this component. And on top of that, we have about 360 million internal requests to our internal REST API. Dependent on the time of the day, that is about 6K per second. Like all our applications, the Perl application is run in two independent data centers. So if one of them burns down, we still hope our platform is up and running. And for the Perl application, we currently have six uh, application server per data center that serve the user-facing requests. We have 18 API server for our internal REST API requests, and for worker server, basically for processing the AMQP messages. So this is only the Perl application, those 20 Ruby on Rails apps I mentioned, and the Scala apps and so on, of course they are uh, on top of that. So how do we maintain and develop that application? This camel, by the way, is in a very nice park in Sofia, so uh, I can recommend to go there. Uh, 
Okay, currently we have four office locations, our headquarters in Hamburg, uh, and then we have offices in Munich, Vienna and Barcelona. We are a bit more than 500 people from a lot of different countries. And about 80 of us are in engineering, while engineering means not only development, but also site operations. Development is done in cross-functional development teams, and basically it's up to each team if they want to do Scrum or Kanban, how much pair programming they do, or how they organize code reviews or any other things to ensure their code quality. Some of the teams are even split over several office locations, so some of us are actually quite good at debugging the video conferencing, but in general it, it works quite well, even with the split teams. Now, if I have written some code, I want to see it run, and that is pretty easy. We have a small web application where I can simply click a button to trigger the setup of a new development virtual machine. It sets up a VM based on VMware for me, and the provisioning is basically Vagrant and Chef. And once this is up and running, I simply rsync my code over there and have my own little version of Xing where I can run my modified code and see how it behaves. We have been using Git for many years, and now since about two or three years, we also have our company internal GitHub, which is very nice. It currently has about 1,800 repositories. We don't have 1,800 projects, of course, so it's many forks and also some personal site projects, but still, our GitHub is pretty popular. We use Jenkins for the continuous integration. It currently has about 30 projects in there, which makes about 250 different build jobs. So anytime I can send my code over to the Jenkins, even my half-baked feature branch I'm currently working on, and check if the build is passing. We also do the deployment using Jenkins. Our Perl application is quite big, it has a lot of dependencies, many different teams are working on it, which is why it still has a weekly release cycle. The smaller, more independent components are deployed by the teams whenever the team feels like it, and that's normally several times a day. Some of the teams even do continuous deployment so that every commit to their master branch directly goes live. So if you work like that, you need a very good monitoring, not only on the operations level, but also for your application. And an excellent tool for that is Logjam. It's also open source software. It's mainly developed by some of our architects. And it listens to AMQP messages from all our application components. And then it aggregates the data and visualizes it. Its official mission is to find performance hotspots and errors in web applications. And it has a zillion different views on the data it has, according to status code application, which controller op was run, and so on and so on. Also, a lot of information about single requests. So here you can see how the time a request needed was actually spent. What was wait time, what was view time, what was database time, and so on. Graphite is basically a front-end to stats D and can turn everything from I.O. to energy consumption into a graph. And I particularly like this one. It's also an application we've built ourselves. It visualizes the number of requests and the time they need it in some kind of heat map. 
So this was a very good day. Basically, everything is green. But sometimes you see a red area in here that might even span over several rows. And you see the rows are uh, representing different parts of the platform. So this is a pretty good indicator that the problem you're trying to debug right now may not be in your own application. It might be somewhere totally different, but spilling over several components. And if you have some bigger red area in here over several rows, you immediately notice that. Okay, that's it. This is my favorite line of Perl code. It was really live until a couple of weeks ago. Maybe it's not so sad that it's gone. Thank you very much for your attention. I guess we're already a bit over time, so if you have any questions, uh, you can find me in the hallway uh, for the rest of the day. Thank you very much.